NPR is proud to present an interview with 10,000 Maniacs Friday, April 30th at 3 p.m. Join us for a conversation with Steve Gustafson and Dennis Drew. The way this works is we'll ask them the questions and then they just simply... The Maniacs will be performing before a sold-out crowd at RIT that night. We'll cover everything from the early days back in Jamestown, straight up through their latest release, Our Time in Eden. Join Jim Yurcho and me, David Kostak, for your chance to win autographed cassettes. So listen, Friday, April 30th at 3. Only on WITR. And you're listening to 89.7 WITR, Henrietta, and uh, Nate, give me a hand signal. Are we good? We're good. Okay, we're talking to uh, Steve Gustafson here, the bass player for the band 10,000 Maniacs. They're going to be playing at RIT this evening uh, on a sold-out concert with a band called Zap Mama opening up the show. Um, Hello, hello. He is here. Hello. And it works. Is this on? All right, Yeah, it's on my headphones. Is it on yours? Nah, I can't hear a thing. Hey, well, you know, you... You know how college radio works. You started a, a station in Jamestown, if I'm yeah, not absolutely. mistaken. Absolutely. WJWK, 91.5 FM, Jamestown. In the car Feed your head. Feed your head? Was yeah. that your slogan? Yeah, that was our slogan. Is it still the slogan? Uh, we ran it into the ground. <laughs> ran it into the ground. They, uh, no, actually, when uh, when we left, um, there just weren't, there weren't, weren't enough interested students in our, at our small community college to uh, keep it going, and they, they ended up forfeiting their their 10 watt license and uh, went to uh, um, in-house radio just within the campus only. Okay. Yeah, we got in serious trouble with the community too. We were doing some weird stuff out there, and it was namely, uh, well, you know, <laughs> just I can't really say. Sure, you can. Just I'm, don't I'm, do it again. Just I'm don't apply- do it again. Right, I'm applying for a license in Jamestown for a ah. uh, for a commercial radio station. So um, I see. Uh, I, I got to try to bury that past. Hmm, <laughs> I can use it on my resume, but uh, no, actually, we we. Um, we had a hard time convincing the students that the Clash were pretty cool to listen to, so uh, they didn't. <laughs> they were continually signing petitions trying to get it, get rid of us as uh, the program director, music director of the radio station. So it was uh, it was a good battle. We those petitions ultimately failed, and that's a really bad idea to try to do, right? I I told <laughs> I I tell you what I told the administration. I said, go ahead, you know, try to make you know stop, get me to stop playing it. I'll just quit. You know, I don't need any. I don't need this hassle. So. Uh, Dennis Drew was uh, a friend of yours, worked at the radio station also? Yeah, still is a friend of mine. Okay. Hey, oddly enough. <laughs> I, was, I was the best man in his wedding. In, in meeting the other members of the Maniacs for the first time, what was your, what was your first impression? Uh, well, Natalie was very young. She was a young woman of 16 years, and uh, I was actually doing a radio shift one a- summer afternoon, and uh, she came in with an armload of... Uh, she had some Brian Ferry and some Bob Marley and some other sort of glam rock records and s- asked if I would play them. And I said, sure, come on in. Have a seat. And uh, we just got to know each other. And uh, I, g- I asked her to get involved with the radio station. And uh, Rob Buck used to, uh, he had a uh, he had the graveyard shift at a local factory in, that was nearby the uh, college because uh, our 10-watt station didn't go very far. And he used to listen to my radio shift on Friday nights. And... Um, we got to know each other over the phone, just making requests. He'd call up and ask me to play El Costello and stuff like that. And uh, he said he had this band. He wanted to, uh, you know, he needed some gigs. They wrote their own songs. I said, we'll get you a gig down here. And they came down, and they, they were called The Obsessions, and they played, a, did a few sort of uh, New Wave coffee houses for us. And um, their drummer had to go back to prison or something, so his band <laughs> kind of broke up. And, That'll uh, do it. That'll yeah, do it. right. Nine times and, out of ten. And, uh... We started the, uh, you know, c- sort of started this band called Still Life, which was uh, what we were before 10,000 Maniacs, and then we asked Natalie to come down and join us in our all-night jam sessions, and, uh, you know, when she could sneak out of her house, she would, and, um, you know, the rest is the proverbial history. Um, so much of the focus of the band falls on her, on um, the press and, and wherever else. Do you, do, you, uh, do you ever feel like your roles aren't equal? Well, uh, our roles aren't equal, but um, if you're a role player, it doesn't matter. And um, if you're a team player and you play in an ensemble, you have a part to play, and it might it might be one or two notes. And uh, if you play them well, ultimately everything sounds sounds great. Um, as the uh, vocalist and the lyric writer, um, she should have all the attention because I cannot speak for 
the words she writes. I can give right. my interpretation to the to the songs, but uh, ultimately they're it's, they're her lyrics, and um, she does a wonderful job with it. So I really don't you know like get in the way of that. Um, I can remain very anonymous. I can walk down the street. I can walk through the crowd at our gigs before the show, and no one will know who I am. She unfortunately has people following her all the time, and it's a real pain in the neck, and it's frightening sometimes where you get uh, fans that are so obsessed that they don't leave you alone, and. Um, She's, besides the fact that she's put up with the four boys in the band for all these years, uh, <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> I really give her a lot of credit. And I don't, um, it, you know, we have hassles with our op we argue with our office all the time, our management. And, uh, you know, when they, they forget to do things for us, they're, they're, they got to consider her, you know. She's, uh, she's um, you know, she needs to be kept safe and warm and tidy. I can take care of myself. Uh, uh, our time in Eden is uh, slightly lighter thematically is yeah. that is that in direct response to the uh, cr uh, critical critics and whatnot of the last album uh, hmm no you know when we write songs uh, when we're rec writing songs for an album we uh, we just get together and hash out these ideas musical ideas and whatever uh, happens to uh, um, perk Natalie's interest she starts she'll write lyrics for it mm -hmm. and um, you know, musically, uh, I think it's certainly it is a little more up than what uh, Blind Man Zoo was. Um, we took our time with this album. We rehearsed a lot more than we did for the last album. We spent a year writing and, and practicing these songs. Um, we were really happy with Paul Fox as a producer, and uh, we had the, our most enjoyable time in the studio ever. We had a great time. And uh, um, I think that those feelings and emotions really, uh, so really, really show. Um, we also spent a lot of time during the during rehearsals for the album, um, learning to communicate with each other once again because we we were with each other practically every minute of every every day for uh, ten years. And you can, as a dysfunctional family that we are, you can get on each other's nerves. So we needed time away from each other, and that's what 19 we did in 1990. Yeah, and then um, um, of course we're releasing the uh, hope Ch hope chest to uh, sort of uh, for our fans keep the name out there so people didn't forget about us. And then uh, when we got back together, it was uh, you know we really wanted to get to know each other again, and uh, we worked hard on communicating and uh, musically and verbally, and, uh, and it shows. In that period in 1990, after uh, I imagine the tour was wrapped up for Blind Man Zoo, was there the thought of uh, never going back to it? Did that come up? Well, um, you know, since the beginning, I mean, we've never really assured ourselves that there was going to be another album or another gig. We always, we've just sort of taken things one day at a time, seriously, and um, not really get too involved in the future until we have a project that we're working on. Um, you know, so we've always sort of lived like that. You know, it might last another year, it might not. And it's not, you know, as far as we're concerned, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not that big a deal. We've had... Uh, it's been incredible uh, 12 years, and mm -hmm. uh, I think there will always be uh, more records from 10,000 Maniacs. Um, you touched on the, the critical, uh, mentioned that last time, what, what kind of impact they might have or whatever. Um, in reading the review for Our Time in Eden, I thought this was an amazing sentence. A gripping record with a provocative, unnerving power. When you read those kind of things, what's your what kind of response does that get from you? Is it just like, <clears throat> is it confusing to you sometimes? or? Well, I, I found that... Um, um, most most critics, I, w I don't know what, what, what that reviews rolling, that, that was. Rolling that was Anthony the big, Curtis, uh, yeah, yeah, the four star summer. The, yeah. yeah, well, um, Anthony is really one of the f one of the few critics. Well, there's a few. I mean, like Bill Flanagan, over at musician. Um, they're just people that I've gotten to know, and they they seem to really be paying attention to what we're doing. And most reviews of concerts and reviews of the albums, um, p um, inter the reviewers can't even get the names right. They they can't. There's so much that you can't believe that's that gets, you know, when when. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah, I I don't take too much of it to heart, good or bad. Um, all I care is that they're writing about it, and it really doesn't matter what they say, because bad ink is better than no ink. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, ultimately, I mean, if if we're uh, we're doing interviews, we're selling records. If the name's out there, that's really what's important as far as selling records. Uh, what kind of musical evolution do you see that's prominent? In, uh, in the new album as to say uh, Blind Men's Zoo? Uh, I think the biggest factor is we got better as musicians and mm. uh, we did a lot of woodshedding for uh, for this album um, 
and I think that's how it's been all along. Um, we kind of, we were a few songs short, I think, for Blind Man Zoo, and we pulled a few uh, old ideas out, sort of resurfaced them, and um, like the lion's share was, it was an idea that we'd written a few years before that, and, you know, we just sort of needed something, and, and uh, we said, hey, what about lion's share? So we brought it back out. Um, I, yeah, I, we weren't as prepared for that. We were, we were for uh, our time at Eden, we were really well prepared, really relaxed, really confident. I think uh, that's, um, we, we, we experimented with a different form of songwriting for our time in Eden. That was a, um, um, a just sort of, we used flashcards. We picked flashcards and just jammed in any key, major, minor key. The flashcard would be, re and recorded all on DAT machine. And then we'd have to go back and listen to these hundred some hours of jamming. Mm -hmm. And with no real discussion beforehand, we'd just start playing. It was all nonsense, like a train wreck. And occasionally an idea would surface through this sort of jamming and we'd all sort of latch onto it. And we, we got three songs written like that. Took forever, wasted a lot of time, but we were, we uh, were, but, wasted? but the, but the, um, the thing was we were playing in all the different keys and we were really, you know, getting our chops back and uh, all that kind of stuff. How would you interpret the lyrical evolution of Natalie's? with this record well you know i think she's getting better too it's of course it's a little more of a personal record i think for her and um you know i i really um although i've been with no natalie for 12 12 years 13 years i mean re i really don't know her i mean we've traveled on the road and and seen each other for 24 hours a day but uh, <laughs> she's a very um she really she really uh respects i respect her want of privacy and all that and um you know, we r really only speak on a musical level. Uh, do you always agree with what she has to say in the lyrics? Um, I have so far, yes. Sorry. That's quite alright. Coming up with a trivia question to all ask because right. we got some giveaways to do, all right. and I got to tell these guys what the answers are going to be. Right. Um, why don't we do that right now? We've got okay. uh, a couple pairs to give away. We'll do one pair right now together with a autographed copy of uh, a cassette copy of Our Time in Eden. At least I assume it'll be autographed. And uh, well, I'll sign it. All right. Thank you very much. I've gotten good at forging Natalie's name. Well, too, we got so. a trivia question. So the first person who can get uh, get this question right. Uh, 10,000 Maniacs released uh, two records on their own before being signed to Elektra and named the, uh, what was the name of the label on which they issued them? It's a name that they uh, came up with themselves, and let's just see if anyone can get it. 475-2271 is the number to call, uh, so any we'll give 10,000 you a hint. Maniacs fans, I'll, I'll give you a hint. hint. I'll give you a hint. It's, it's our publishing company now. All right, so if you've got any old ones and you can run to a, uh, to a record, there you have it. All right, we got it. So, um... No more calls. We'll be giving another one away in just a little bit. Um, I read somewhere that when it started and when you were doing the uh, radio shows out in uh, Jamestown, you were, a, you were a big punk rock fan. You mentioned The Clash earlier. Mm -hmm. I don't hear a whole lot of punk in even the early stuff that's going on. Do you have any idea where that comes well, from? Well, actually, the, uh, when, I say, um, when I say punk rock, it was more of just an attitude about playing music, and it was an attitude that you don't have to be a virtuoso to... to uh, to play an instrument, you don't have to play like Jimi Hendrix, or you don't have to play like the uh, those those bands in the '70s that I was listening to when I grew up. That and that the thing that punk rock music, um, um, the attitude that that gave me was that you shouldn't be afraid to uh, to try it. And uh, three chords are plenty for a song, and a good song is a good song, whether it's played poorly or not. And uh, um, that's 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 why we really call ourselves a punk rock band. At least I do. It's, it was just all an attitude. And if you listen to some of the earlier stuff, I mean, it's all just like two chords. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my mother of the war I think was three, and um, right. it just don't don't be afraid to try it. And we were, we were uh, we learned as we went along. You know, we we didn't. I didn't know how to play the bass guitar when we started. I had no idea. And we just um, just sort of we're still learning. Hmm. You know, our influences musically come from all over the place, right. but um, um, and certainly at that time, if you would have heard some of our early rehearsals, you know, it would definitely was punk rock. But you know, we evolved, we got better, we learned how to end songs, we learned how to begin, start songs. And when John John Lombardo joined the band, um, when uh, after we we were still life for about a year, and then when John joined, we went to, we were Ten Thousand Maniacs, and uh, he he taught us how to end songs and stuff instead of just with feedback and. Uh, and uh, noise and stuff. When he left in 19, I think it was 86? Yeah. And uh, Natalie almost left, if I 
understand. Uh, what well, she, I think she quit for a couple months. What, what were you thinking at that point? Is uh, it over? Are you going to try to find someone new? Well, I had, I had just met the, uh, the woman who I eventually married, so uh, you know, I was happily in love and didn't care <laughs> <laughs> what happened. Um, yeah, you know, it's... You know, there's... Um, what's the... You know, I, we, we don't worry about the Yeah, you, you said earlier you're going kind of one day at a time with it, and that's you know, probably indicative of that. Matter. Right. You know, actually, when, jo when John left, there, we, there was a lot of um, stress and tension that was going on within the band members. Mm. And when he quit, um, some of that was lifted. And we uh, we were he had written a lot of the songs to that point, so we knew that, oh, we've got to write some more songs. So, um, you know, we, we sort of got down to work, and uh, it, ins it inspired us, actually. And, I, and then we got uh, In My Tribe out of that. For in my tribe, you were you were chosen, or you chose, or was given uh, Peter Asher as producer. Uh, he worked with the likes of like Linda Ronstadt and James Taylor. Were you reluctant to work with somebody who's kind of out of the alternative vein of music? Well, um, you know, he's got the Peter Peter Asher has the Midas touch, and um, you know everything he touched turned gold. So we were uh, certainly hoping that we could get a gold record out out of his name. Um, he uh, he was uh, he's a good friend with the president of Electra, Uncle Bob Krasnow, and uh, Bob really wanted him. Mm. And uh, he, they let us pick our the first producer. And I don't know if you're going to use that as a trivia question, so I'll, I'll no, save no, that. that. That wasn't one of them. Okay, well, <laughs> Joe Boyd, who is a displaced American, lives in England. Uh, we really wanted Joe Boyd to do it, and the record company were thought, you, you know. It's not going to work, but they let us do it anyway. So I think that uh, the second album was their call. They wanted Peter Asher. They wanted to make up for the money they lost in the first one. Okay. And then I understand there's a, a little bit of friction in the studio during that time of the recording of Tribe in terms of his style. Uh, well, um, yeah, Peter, um, we, we went total. We had George Massenberg engineering the album, and George is like this weird genius guy who invented automated faders, and uh, he builds his own reverb systems. And he was really into the serious digital stuff. So we had we were going direct to disc mm -hmm. with a couple of songs as an experiment, and it was pretty wild playing all the parts on the synclav and uh, and uh, into the computer. And he had these just this banks banks of computers that were you know like eight feet high. In, in these racks and nothing but just a little like on light right and just like flat fronts right and he he brought us in there and he said look at that isn't that just amazing and he's standing there staring at it and we thought well this guy's nuts <laughs> and uh but we were it was pretty cool you know trying uh going direct to disc and hearing what you could do and how you could take syllables out of natalie's words and you can it just so you could just so change it but it made made the albums pretty stiff and we r really weren't really didn't get to be really good friends with Peter Asher. He's a little older than we are, and um, he, we were in L.A., and that was where he lived, so he was, like, going home at night, and uh, he was always busy. Uh, this the, um, Blind Man Zoo we did out in Woodstock, so we got Asher out of, New out of L.A., so it was, we were a little more focused, but um, we still kind of did some digital stuff that we think really makes, our, makes us sound too stiff and too sterile, so we went with the... Um, um, went all totally analog for this last album uh, for our time in Eden with Paul Fox. Let's uh, listen to a cut from the In My Tribe record. The song is called Hey Jack Kerouac. You're listening to an interview with Steve Gustafson, the bass player in 10,000 Maniacs. They're going to be performing this evening at RIT's Frank Ritter Memorial Ice Arena. Um, we'll be back in a little bit. We've got some more giveaways to do. Uh, sit back and enjoy this cut. <laughs> Once again, for those of you just joining us, we're talking with Steve Gustafson, bass player in the band 10,000 Maniacs. Do Yo. You, do you ever want to uh, go back and redo old stuff? Do you ever have that urge? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think we could... I mean, I'm under... Actually, when we, after we uh, write and record an album... And then we get out on tour and start playing the songs. That by the end of the tour, the songs are so much better than they are when they started. And uh, in fact, on uh, the Wishing Chair, we were uh, in a studio in London. And uh, right, why I don't know, but right in the middle of recording, doing the re recording the, al the the uh, the album, we went on a little two-week tour of Germany. 
and uh, and you know everyone got sick and all that kind of stuff. And uh, um, <laughs> I hear about that with Mexico, but not so much with Germany. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> just getting out there and touring and uh, you know being out on your own like that it was pretty weird. We are uh, the vehicle we had was a sort of a big van. We had all the equipment and all the the crew and and uh, us and our luggage and stuff and uh, the starter went on it so we had to jump start this uh, big Mercedes sort of truck all the way through uh, Germany it was pretty hysterical I, d I didn't think they were going to let us on the ferry to get across the uh, the channel there um, so when we got back to the studio after that little two weeks the songs were like way better but we had already recorded the basic tracks and felt that we really didn't want to spend the money to redo them you know and so you know, I think you know they always get better and we I you know, if I had the time, but it costs money to do that. Yeah. It's a waste of time. I mean, really, we'd rather just write another new song than go back and do something else, you know. Some, you know, kind of. It's, you know, art's not eternal. The CD might be around forever, but, I mean, bottom line is we had fun. It, we've had a great time, and, uh, you know, that's that's there. It's, it's maybe a little embarrassing, some of that early stuff, but uh, that's, what, that's part of growing up, you know. Right. Uh, the song Peace Train uh, was deleted from In My Tribe and uh, supposedly was uh, didn't want to be recorded in the first place. Uh, can you explain some of that? Right. The old wart on the end of our nose. That's been dogging <laughs> us ever since. We can't, get rid of, can't get people to stop asking <laughs> people us are to curious. Clip. I think yeah. people I think people listening might be curious about it, which is the only reason I brought Well, I'll tell them if they, if they promise not to request it tonight at the show because it really pisses us off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... The tour, we were doing a few weeks leading up to going into the studio to uh, for In My Tribe. We were kind of working our way across the country, playing some gigs, working out the songs. And somewhere on the, I don't know, on the road, Natalie, as she does occasionally, sings some a cappella stuff in between songs. And she started singing that at one of the gigs. It was uh, some gig they had to do. It was pretty hysterical. We really didn't know how to we were just sort of jamming along that you know with without a real arrangement and just sort of jamming on, the, on an a chord and she was sort of singing over the top of it in a sort of a dub sort of monotone sort of thing and it's we were, we were playing in this bar and a huge fight broke out you know with these, <laughs> these college students to the song peace train gotcha <laughs> and uh, i thought it was very ironic and so we just started fooling around with the song on those that two weeks or three weeks it took us to get across the country and uh when we got we got in the studio, we sort of forgot about it, and we were uh, sitting around waiting, like you do a lot when you're in the studio, waiting for something to be fixed or uh, something like that. And uh, we just started sort of fooling around with that song again, just as out of boredom. And then Peter Asher was like, "Great, great!" Came running out. That's great. We'll do it. This will be perfect. It'll be a hit. You'll be rich. We'll all be rich. <laughs> and we said, "Oh, really? Well, we really don't know a song. We're just sort of goofing around." He said, "Well, we'll learn it. You know, we'll, whatever we need, we'll get it." So. We were thought, oh, yeah, that might be interesting. And the record company, of course, ate it up. They thought it was the most brilliant idea ever, and uh, that like that failed miserably. I mean, it, the thing, it, the, the, the one thing, <laughs> the one thing that um, Peace Train did for us was it got us, it got radio programmers to play us b when they were afraid of the name. You know, right. they've always been afraid of the name, and it's kind right. of it's that's been dogging us for a while too. I like it. I like the, I like the fact that it challenges people to 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 think that life is full of ironies and, yeah. and that you can't judge a person by the color of their skin or a book by its cover or, or a band by its name. So we loved it for that, that sense. But it's it was we were getting a hard time getting played on CHR radio and that. So they started playing it, but they weren't saying who the, who the name of the band was because they didn't want to upset their regular listeners. But we got airplay with it. So it was kind of a weird Catch-22 thing going on. Um, when the Ayatollah Khomeini um, came out and insisted that Salman Rushdie's uh, satanic verses be burned and his and Salman's head be chopped off and brought to him. Uh, Cat Stevens um, publicly agreed with what the Ayatollah's um, um, sentence was. So um, we felt that was the perfect chance to uh, stop playing that song and get it. It took us forever to get it taken off the album. And there's probably, a, probably only a couple hundred maybe, I don't know, 10,000, 20 or 30,000 records that have it off. I mean, it, they had printed most, it sold right. 1.3 million, and I'll bet I'll bet a million of them have it on there. And it took us forever to get the, the record company, a lot of arguing, a lot of bickering, and all that kind of stuff. So we finally got to take it off. And so we just don't play it anymore. And, you know, it's that simple. Yeah. We really don't want to play it. We never right. will play it. So there's no... no uh, 
There's no no chance if you're thinking that you're going to yell it tonight. There's no chance. So save your breath. You have a better chance screaming. I hope that I don't fall in love with you by Tom Waits because we know that one and we like it. <laughs> so that's a, a uh, request suggestion. Well, that's <laughs> okay. that's a good one. That's I mean, we haven't played that, we, that one's possible. We recorded it for uh, B-side with um, uh-huh. with uh, the, we did the David Bowie uh, song Starman. And that was on the B-side of the uh, first single in um, over in across the pond in Europe. Hmm. And uh, we don't do Starman. We really haven't done it since that night we recorded it, which was an incredibly magical evening. But uh, maybe someday. We've worked out some other covers for fun that no one will get. They go right, they're old songs that go right over every college kid's heads. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's fun to play, you know. In, uh, Break up the boredom. Reading some of the old, old, actually this one I think is out of the, the most recent Rolling Stone article, the cover story. Um, your drummer, Jerome, had an interesting comment. So <laughs> I'll read it as a quote. I know the quotes aren't always accurate. To an extent, as you grow older, it looks kind of pathetic to strike an anti-authoritarian pose. Do you agree with, with that idea? Well, I think that, uh, you know, if you... Uh, well, when you become older, you become the authority, in a sense. And uh, to, to sort of strike that pose, when you see, uh, you know, Mick Jagger out there... Um, I don't know, what was his last song about? Uh, nuclear Meltdown? Or what was I his have no idea. Single? Yeah, I mean, he just kind of go, wow, that's pretty pathetic. I mean, <laughs> and in fact, but his album is great, actually. I think his album's great. And I, I think he's got some great songs on there. But uh, in, uh, I think... I was in the room when, we, when, uh, when uh, Jerry said that, but... Um, yeah, it's hard. Most interviews are taken out of context, right? And uh, when, it, especially when the editor gets a hold of it and then edits stuff out, and there's bits of the story that they figure it doesn't matter what people know. Um, you know, I mean, I don't. Um, I'm not anti-authority. I'm just. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm pro-choice. I think people should choose to do what they want to do, and you should also choose to be responsible for your actions. Is what it comes down to. Is what I think. And if you do that. You know, if, you, if if the things you choose to do aren't, isn't going to harm anyone else, then you sh- you really don't have a problem, I don't think. But when you start screwing with the, you know, look, you know, you look at the Rodney King thing, and what do you believe? Or Waco, Texas, what do you believe? The uh, the media told us. Do you believe that the FBI didn't did or didn't start the fire? Do you you know Do you believe that th- those cops had a right to uh, beat uh, Rodney King like that? It's hard. It's hard to tell. I think just from what you see and what you read, you really to get to get true facts is really um, is really uh, it's a hard thing to do, and that's what I think we we should all strive to do: just get truth. Thanks for joining us this afternoon and uh, tonight. Yeah, that was cool ending, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was nice. Thanks. It was nice. It was nice. It worked out Sorry. beautifully. Right. Um, tonight, once again, the show is at RIT. And well, this actually, this look. next song is going to be perfect for that whole spiel, wasn't it? And yeah. I, I got it on my soapbox there, but uh, perfect. It's a song about uh, patience and tolerance and things like that. Before we head into that, we do have the absolute last pair of tickets that anyone could possibly get to this gig. They're going to be uh, giving them away right now. One more trivia question. You mentioned John Lombardo earlier. Um, a former member of the band has gone on to form a uh, Buffalo duo. Uh, they're based out of Buffalo anyway. And uh, if you can give me the name of that group, they have two records out on the Ryko Disc label. The most recent is called The Weed Killer's Daughter. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Group. And live, uh, they play. They played in town fairly often. And yep. live... Uh, enthralling engaging i mean it's just it's it's brilliant and uh i can't give you the woman's name who, he, who he's performing with however she, she is performed with us quite a bit phenomenal she's phenomenal also I'm appears sure. on the new ani defranco record as well but anyway and the goo goo dolls she played on a goo goo dolls record she played a violin solo on their single well, she's also right. in the video there's a nice picture of her in the video so yeah they're good friends with those guys those guys are great too all right like if you can them. give me the name of that duo uh four seven five two two seven one is the number down here you'll pick up one uh pair of tickets to the show tonight as well, you'll get an autographed copy of the tape. Thanks for joining us today. Thank and, you, guys. Uh, let's and, take uh, it out. Thanks, WITR. Yeah. Is, uh, Alternative Radio is the, uh, has been the, uh, the, the cornerstone and the lifeblood of our career. They've really helped us out a lot. We really appreciate it. Thanks. It's a song called Tolerance from the new record, Our Time in Eden. <laughs> 